I'm delighted to have on the Wiggly sofa once again Kitty Corrigan from the Country Living magazine. I believe you're the deputy editor, Kitty. That's right. And today we're going to talk about the Country Living magazine's campaign for fair trade for farmers. We've heard so much about fair trade for developing countries, Rich. Yeah, I think there, there are slight discrepancies, aren't there? You know, in fact, I met a guy and I was doing a gig for Wigglies. It was a, it was a schools thing, and there was a guy there from a fair trade, and I said, "You know, what about fair trade for English farmers?" And he's he was a bit British, put, darling. He's a bit, well, British, yeah, yeah, British, <laughs> sure, sure. But that's what I mean um, when I say English. I mean British. Oh, <laughs> oh that's that's oh. opening a can of worms. Uh, yeah, that's a can of worms. Yeah, that's you quite get him. Right. I have English. And, uh, so many people, English people, just assume that oh, Scotland and Wales, they're just sort of add-on. Aren't they? Yeah, well, they I'm are. always storing out <laughs> English and putting British. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it was interesting uh, recently when, when uh, I mean, you know, the, through devolution, but uh, but it was interesting that the Scottish parliamentarians still had to swear an allegiance to the Queen when they were sworn in recently, which I thought was quite quite interesting. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm digging uh, I'm digging that yes, whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Myself, yeah. But, it's going to be deeper but, uh, than you Yeah, no, but I, I, when I go back, when I did say to the guy, um, we're going to have, I'm going to have all sorts of hate mail on that and stuff, aren't I? Yeah. But he, he, he said to uh, follow on after the cats thing. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> He, uh, he he was quite put out that I I you know said to him what about fair trade for English farmers and he didn't have much of a retort British British sorry you <laughs> British farmers well, I would have said English farmers <laughs> really British so uh, but yeah but so so it's interesting for, uh, for for Kitty to be to be able to sort of put the whole thing into context for us really in many respects. I mean, you know, looking at it holistically, what is the significance of fair trade? Well, I suppose just to take one example, we all approve and most of us can afford and are prepared to buy fair trade coffee from Kenya or Ethiopia. And it gives us that nice glow that we've done something good. We know that that farmer has been paid a fair price and that they've had a a contract where they can plan more than a few months in advance. So we have our fair trade coffee and then we add our milk But how many people think of the dairy farmer that produced that milk? And so it's getting people to think when they go to buy, whether it's we're concentrating on dairy, beef and and sheep. I mean, next year we might go on to arable and fruit. But those are the the three areas that we think are most at risk. And we want to explain to people that even if they don't care about farmers, and some people don't or they don't even think about farmers, everybody cares about the countryside. And that's the one thing that unites people uniquely in Britain, I think. And I know, I think it was Bill Bryson, who's the new president of the Campaign to Protect Rural England, said that if you ask anybody in this country what their ambition is, it's to have a place in the country. So everybody loves the countryside, but they don't realise the countryside is the way it is because of the farmers who manage it and maintain it. And certain areas are particularly good because of the soil or the geology, particularly good for, for beef cattle, for example. Mm. And the landscape develops along a certain way. And because the cattle are there, then the wildlife is helped and the birds. It's all one holistic idea. So, so if you're going to buy Argentinian beef, where we know that fruit and mouth is endemic in Argentina and Botswana and their cattle are routinely vaccinated, but it is cheaper. If you're going to buy Argentinian beef, have you thought of the beef farmer in Britain and what's going to happen to him? His meat is of a higher quality, but it is more expensive. And our welfare standards in this country are much higher than elsewhere. So if you're not going to buy the British beef, the beef farmer can't afford to rear cattle that aren't going to be eaten because that's what they're there for. They're reared for us to eat, (coughs) although I am vegetarian, but I can see that that's why the animals are there. If there's no demand for that meat, then farmers go out of business and you're going to have empty fields. You're going to have the scenario we had in Herefordshire at the time of Frittenmouth when the fields were silent Mm. and there were funeral pyres around us. Well, there won't be the funeral pyres, but there'll be the empty fields Mm. and a lot of the pasture would then revert to woodland and where sheep graze, then you'll have the bracken coming back and we just want people to think we can do something to prevent that happening, and that's supporting British farmers. Things are changing, aren't they? I mean, people are reading more into how they're behaving, how they how they eat, and how they dress and whatnot. I think particularly, I, yes, the whole thing about. Hmm. You not think on, on a, a Saturday. Saturday. 
on a Saturday you go out and you want to do something very special and you want to buy into that but what about the rest of the week do you really think about what you're eating when you're in a restaurant or wherever it is I think that we are starting to change but often it's how our mood is so particularly people are very keen on free range turkeys at Christmas time Mm. but not necessarily at the rest of the year so I think we're getting there and certainly your campaign will help but the question that's just burning I'm burning to ask you is if you're going to have the fair trade campaign and the emblem of fair trade how are direct beef farmers going to possibly apply that aren't you in danger of putting some people off connecting with farmers directly by having the fair trade emblem when a lot of people would find that difficult to buy into? Well, there isn't going to be a fair trade emblem because one of the people that we've been working with is the Fair Trade Foundation and they actually came along to the Hay Festival and spoke at our event and they're, I wouldn't say a voice of dissent, but they've pointed out that it's not their policy to try and apply the fair trade mark to produce in this country, partly because you can't compare the two situations. You know, they were set up to deal with developing countries and you can't compare the poverty situation of farmers there. But we wanted to work with the Fair Trade Foundation to show that we're not saying we don't care about those farmers. We're just saying, you know, charity begins at home. We've got to care about our own farmers as well. And we don't think a label campaign would work anyway because there are just too many labels already. You've got <laughs> oh, the lead tractor, labels. you've got the, you know, the leaf mark, you've got soil association. And by the time you read through all of those and then look for has it got hydrogenated fats and how much salt has it got, well, you would just never get your shopping done yeah <laughs> phil i know you've got views on this so. well I, I what i was going to say was that I, I think it's great that somebody has actually extended the idea of fair trade that it can I- include our own country because of course fair trade the principle of it started that where the consumer wasn't in a position to see what happened in africa or developing countries where these imported foods were grown fair trade was a <coughs> movement that allowed them to have some faith that somebody had gone and had a look And in this country, we have the ability to show people directly so that for fair trade, what we're really talking about is having the conversation between the producer and the person who ultimately buys and consumes the food and then make a judgment based on the fact that they are educated in how that food was produced and where it came from. And that the fair trade movement, as we understand it, in relation to coffee and bananas and so on, facilitates that. But the the principle applies here. It is the fact that the consumer knows how it's produced, where it's come from, and then perceives, because of what they know, it to be worth an amount of money. And the farmer can explain why it has to be a price in order for him to make a living. It's crucial, and that way the supermarkets can be involved because the consumer goes to the supermarket and says, I want Phil Gorringer's beef or whatever. The supermarket will quite willingly supply that to them. But if I go and tell the supermarket, you've got to have my beef and you've got to pay me this, they'll say, well, we're not interested. The people they're interested in are their customers, not their suppliers. Yes, and customers and buyers of magazines can have a huge impact just just by saying this is what we want. And we're working with Waitrose on this campaign, they've shown that it is possible to look after producers and farmers and they are one of the very few who actually will give the long term contracts and pay above the market rate. So okay, people will say Waitrose shoppers, you know, upper middle class, plenty of money, but it's not that. It's it's a case of all the others could copy them, could follow them. And, and I do don't, that. don't you think that they will follow on in time? Yeah, historically, it takes a leader. Waitrose is yes. showing the way. But in time, the other major retailers mm. will say, well, this is good stuff. We can do this. We have the same infrastructure. Yes. Let's go. Yes, and hopefully they'll be pressurised into doing that. But, I mean, milk is the one example where Waitrose pay a bit more but the cost to the consumer is practically the same. And we take the example of people will pay a pound for a plastic bottle of water, which isn't any better than tap water. But they something like milk, which is so much more nutritious, they expect to get it at a rock-bottom price. And it costs more to produce than the farmers get for their milk. And, well, that's just crazy. And I don't think consumers realise that. And they'd be just as happy to pay 50p rather than 45p 
but a lot of the supermarkets will use milk as a loss leader. They'll sell it really cheaply to get you in, so you do all your other shopping there. Do you not think that part of it is the farmers' fault themselves? If farmers got together, then why would you sell a product at a loss? Well, some of them have joined up to avoid going under. I mean, the dairy house at Webley, quite near here, that's what they did. Five farmers who weren't going to be able to afford to continue individually. And also two of them had sons who wanted to continue farming. But that wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't joined together and added value to their milk. So they produce creams and cheeses and yogurts and cheesecake. And people will pay more for that. Their products aren't cheap. They are sold in which and they're sold, I think Neil Jard as well, they're, they're sold in quite a few outlets. But yeah, the, people are prepared to pay more for that. But not everybody can do that, I suppose. And some farmers, again, maybe they don't have four other neighbours who they can join with. And they're also so, there's such a stranglehold with what the supermarkets demand and also all the paperwork for DEFRA that they have to do. So maybe it's hard just to think laterally. You're just kind of struggling to survive a lot of the time. Where will you go with this campaign? Well, every month in Country Living magazine, we've got a feature related to the campaign and we're going to, to finish the campaign well, this stage of it, during British Food Fortnight in October, and hopefully we'll be able to report back on whatever achievements we have by that time. The local MP for this area, Roger Williams, has raised our campaign in the House of Commons uh, with an early day motion, which is like a kind of petition that people can sign up to, anybody, you know, members of the public, other MPs. So we're hoping that that will help politically. We're not a political magazine, so (coughs) we're not not marching on Downing Street, but we're doing it in different ways. And also we're not a doom and gloom magazine, so we like to highlight positive stories. For example, the co-op at Webley to show what can be done, and possibly other people will be inspired by that. Another great aspect of your magazine is that you can provide the link between effectively a rather faceless plastic carton of milk in the supermarket and some of the glorious countryside we have around here. Your magazine has a lot of photographs in it, and it, you know, mm. it's good pictures, and so that you can link our countryside and what it looks like. And you quite rightly said just now that if there are no livestock, the countryside will change. Mm. You know, some of it will go to waste and rack and ruin, and others, other bits of it will be ploughed up, and we will lose the patchwork that we've got now. You know, it looks like it does because of farmers, not in spite of them. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly what we're saying. Rich, is this a day you can actually agree with Farmer Phil or not? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly the, the countryside always looks like it does as a consequence of farming. But people should realise that there's a lot of farming that you don't see in Country Living magazine. You know, there are, there are lots of unpleasant pictures that farming is responsible for that aren't shown in Country Living magazine. So whilst, whilst Phil sits there all I knew smug, he couldn't leave it, all <laughs> smug and thinks, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's all very lovely and, uh, and great and portrayed to be just so in Country Living magazine. There is also a, an unpleasant side to farming which has impoverished the let environment me, in let some me circles. Bring well, I don't, us, but I don't get into that yeah but that's because we are a glossy magazine we can't show pictures of young male calves being shot which you might have seen in molly denine's film which went out on channel four and was shown again at the hay festival the lie of the land but her message in that film was exactly the same as ours in the magazine but hers is the dark gritty reality of it but it's the same theme coming through that we have to protect our farmers and keep our countryside a working, living countryside. But yes, we make no apologies for not showing pictures of funeral pyres during Frit and Mouth, for example. But the farming press can, and that's why we're working with Farmers Guardian as well, because they're reaching the real farming community. Ours is a much broader readership, where some of them are farmers but a lot of them are people who like the idea of being a farmer and of course they have to learn and know about all the sad negative side as well and we try and put that across but we're not going to make the magazine a depressing read. 
No, sure. Well, I'm I very say, glad because well, I, I love Country <laughs> Living magazine. <laughs> well, I, well, I just wanted to say that when and the, the point I was trying to make is not not because I imagine the Country Living magazine should portray any bad image because, in actual fact, farming is an integral part of the in the, in the English countryside. You know, it's very very important. It's, it is very important that people are involved in it and appreciate that it is incredibly valuable. You said English countryside. Yeah, again. British, British. <laughs> Good lord! I, just obviously, it's in, it's in me. I'm 37. I'm far too old to, to change my ways but uh, what I was getting at is that there are elements of farming like potato growing for instance in Herefordshire you know you drive through Herefordshire now it all looks lovely green and, and great you know but the fact that hundreds and thousands of acres of potato growing on the in the Y Valley are responsible for adding to the alluvial plain in the Bristol Channel you know and, and the fact that there are hundreds of tons of slug pellets sprayed all over the countryside and all these kind of things that, that you know the, the unpleasant side of farming that people should be made aware of that they are aware of but people also have a chance to challenge you know and people ha- often have a downer on farmers i don't have a downer on farmers i <laughs> I, 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 I appreciate both sides completely i don't think farmers are bad people you know they're not they're they're, they're invariably they're just people trying to you know, make a living like the rest of us but it's important that people have a have, have a good oversight of everything that goes on in farming I think that your campaign is bound to have an influence on that type of farming anyway because as consumers become more interested in what's happening, their demands actually mean that the farmer questions what he or she does and I think that a lot of what Richard's talked about can be taken negatively or positively and lots of farmers will be able to justify what they do and their values and it's important they have their own values and are not completely bamboozled by environmentalists with a secret agenda um, and have a balance that are living to be made as well as looking after the countryside. Armed with all the information, market forces will move the farmers. The farmers that market forces don't move will go out of business. So that if the consumers don't want potatoes grown in a certain way, then they won't buy them and they will, the farmers will do something different. That's how it'll be and that, that's fine by me. One point that you made, Kitty, which I think is great, is that by involving the farming press, there are farmers who will realise that there are people like Country Living magazine, a non-farming press with a biggish circulation, who are fighting in their corner. And I know a lot of farmers who feel that they're on their own. It's Mm. us versus DEFRA. And to have the thought that there are other people who actually care about the countryside and what goes on in it in a positive fashion, and I know I argue with Rich a lot, but there's a lot of environmentalists do a lot of damage by beating farmers incessantly. Most farmers are pretty good environmentalists. They might not have all the information, but they try. And to have magazines like Country Living marketing us effectively mm. to the general public is just great. And I think it's, it's important. It will increase, it will improve their morale. And if you're happier about life, you're much more willing to look objectively at market pressures and say, well, yeah, I could do that differently. What are you going to achieve, Kitty? What's on the, the list of Kitty needs? <laughs> <laughs> All the supermarkets following Waitrose's example. We want them to change the way they deal with their suppliers and we want people to think, not just on a Saturday, how they buy their food and you know keep going to the farmers' markets and everything, but be demanding of the, the supermarkets just as Phil said, you know, we don't want Egyptian potatoes and we want to know when we're buying eggs exactly how many chickens were on that farm. And I think the great sort of scandal of battery farming, I don't, I don't know how people can expect to have a meal from a two-pound chicken that they've bought. You know, it's better to eat less meat and eat better quality and know that the welfare standards are as high as they possibly can be. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming to the Wiggly Sofa. Oh, I'm very sorry about that particular smell because jam has rolled in something and it's still in the room. <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> can you smell it? Who's rolled in jam? Jam. <laughs> jam, you fool. She, oh, she's rolled in something dreadful. It's stuck at my nose. Yeah, that's pretty but great. thank you very much. <laughs>